So my name is Felice Katz, and I am the daughter of two Holocaust survivors, Ethel Bauer and Julian Katz. And those are my parents. Um, my father was born in 19, 1912, and my mother was born in 1922, and I was born several decades later. <laughs> Uh, could you describe your mother's life where you were before all of the other She uh, came from a family that was quite comfortable. Um, they had a house in the city of Buchach in Poland, which is now in Ukraine. And um, they had a farm, and I will be talking about that farm, and it's part of the story, um, about 10 miles east of Butchach. So they went there for holidays, vacations, summer, and everything. So she had a quite comfortable life because they would um, live in the city while they went to school, and then she could go out. She told stories of the swinging in her yard, or they were playing near the river, or um, chasing bees around the property because her father was a, a beekeeper among other things, and um, they, she came from a family of, uh, there were five children, and um, it was a, a comfortable middle class life at that time, there were two properties and, uh, you know, everything they needed or wanted. My father, on the other hand, came from um, an Orthodox family. My mother's family was observant, but my father's was an Orthodox family, but his father died, was killed in World War I, uh, while his mother was pregnant with him. And his mother died when he was 13, so he was orphaned. And he had four brothers and a sister, and he was um, handed from family to family, basically. So his early life was much harder and uh, much more deprived. And uh, he wouldn't eat uh, leftovers because uh, he was, it was almost Dickensian. He was made to eat after, in one family, after the family had eaten, so he got the leftovers. And after that, he wouldn't eat any leftovers anymore. When my mother had leftovers, she had to make it into a whole new meal so that it would be appealing and he wouldn't think it's leftovers. Um, could you tell me a little bit about when the Nazis came to power, what your mother had to say about it, and how her life changed? I can't hear you. Oh, when Can the Nazis came to power, could you explain um, how your mother told you about her life changing when that happened? When the Nazis came to power, they, they well, that's part of it. Actually, I could yeah, launch into my story now because I'll be, I'll be answering that question. The Nazis didn't take over Eastern Poland. They... Well, let me do it then, yeah, okay? Yeah. So, um, okay, <clears throat> she was born, uh, Buczacz was in eastern, southeastern Poland, the part of Poland that is now Ukraine. Ukraine spread over all of southeastern Poland and all the way into Russia. It's, it's a huge country. And my father was from Lvov, which was near Buczacz, not that far away, but they didn't know each other till after the war. And, um, uh, I'm a little, out. oh yeah, okay, so the, 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 my mother told, again, about my mother's upbringing. They lived very close to the center of town, and she tells, told stories of how they used to go swimming and boating on the Stripper River. I love saying that, the Stripper River. It's spelled S-T-R-Y-P-A, but it's Stripper, and it curved around through the center of town. And uh, they used to go swimming and boating in the summer. In the wintertime, it was frozen solid. People would go skating on the river, skiing in the mountains that surround Butchach. There is farmland and mountains. And um, when March came around and the river started to uh, not be so frozen, people used to go and cut blocks of ice from the, ice, from the river to put in their ice cellars. And that was how they kept stuff cold over the summertime. So uh, they went to school, they went to public school, they also went to Hebrew school every day. My mother's brothers had uh, quite um, a rigorous uh, religious education, so did the girls, they went to a girls' Hebrew school. So my, let me tell you about her family. She had an older sister, my mother had a twin brother, and there was a second set of identical twin boys after my mother. 
Twins were all over that family. My mother's, my grandmother, my mother's mother had a set of twin brothers. Those twin brothers, my mother's uncles, were caught in Kristallnacht and they were severely beaten. And they came east to recuperate on my mother's farm where one died of his wounds three weeks later and the other uncle decided that this was uh, a taste of what's to come and he left for Palestine. Um, so she had those, uh, those, uh, fa those are the family members. My mother's mother died when she was 16 because she was brought, she came down with typhus and she was taken to the hospital. The hospital put the Jewish patients in a separate ward just for Jewish patients. The treatment for the Jewish patients consi consisted of the nurses coming in and saying, oh, you still breathing, you dirty Jew? You still alive, you old cow? Literally, my mother told me those are the things that the nurses said. After three days of that kind of treatment, my mother's mother begged to be removed from the facility. It took her father uh, a, a day or two to get her into another facility. It was too late by then, and she died of the typhus. But my family has considered it murder by abuse, murder by neglect. So um, at that point, my mother's older sister, who was uh, quite a few years older than my mother, she sort of became the mother to the younger children. And um, their life went on quite nicely until the war started. And when the war started, uh, the Nazis had a treaty with the Soviet Union. And so they divided Poland. And this is where you had that question about how it was like. Well, they didn't have the Nazis for the first two years of the war because the eastern half of Poland was ruled by the, the Russians. And under the Russians, my mother said life was very hard, but they weren't killing us. So. Among the things that made life hard were, well, they were in forced labor. My mother and her sister, like most of the women, were sent to work on the farms. The men were generally kept in the city doing manual labor, like cleaning the streets or repairing things in the city. My mother's twin was sent to work in a quarry, in a stone quarry that was right outside the town. So he was not sent away, but he was, that was his work, the quarry work. Um, they had, it was hard to get food. You had long lines to wait to get food and then you got to the head of the line and there might be nothing or not what you wanted. If you got anything at all, you took it because you could trade with it. Among the uh, other, of course, the most famous thing that they had was they had to wear the yellow star. And uh, in my mother's uh, region, they didn't wear it sewn onto their clothing, they wore it on an armband so that wherever they went, whatever season, whatever coat, whatever clothing, they could wear it. They didn't have to sew multiple stars onto all of their clothing. So this is what they wore all the time. Now, I know I've been asked several times why self-identify since that got you into trouble, but being a Jew. Um, but the trouble was that if you didn't wear this, the Gestapo, the police, the Russian soldiers had the right to stop anybody, anywhere, anytime, for any reason. And if they stopped you, they asked for your ID, because people had IDs in Europe. To this day, people have IDs in Europe. We have driver licenses. So um, when you took out your ID as a Jew, it had that big J all across it, either in red or in black. And if you had that red J or black J on your ID card and you weren't wearing your yellow star and you got hauled away and nobody ever saw you again. So you wore the yellow star. Um, the children couldn't go to school anymore, the public school. They could still go to the Hebrew school. They could go to the park, but they couldn't sit on the benches because the benches had signs that said, no dogs, no Jews. In some places, they, had, they weren't even allowed in the parks. They weren't allowed in, were not allowed in the theaters, uh, museums, universities, a movie theater, there was a movie theater in Butchach. Uh, all the public places of gathering, they weren't allowed. Jews had to turn in all their valuables because we know all Jews are fabulously wealthy. So any furs, jewelry, money, anything that was of value supposedly had to be turned in. Um, they couldn't walk on the sidewalk. If a non-Jew came by, 
that you had to get off and stand in the gutter. They couldn't stand on the sidewalk. So these were just a sampling of the hundreds of restrictions. But one of the things my mother kept pointing out, as hard as that was and as difficult as that was, they weren't killing us. And that was what was going on in the western half of Poland under the Nazis themselves. So um, that was the first two years of rule. And then in July of 1941, can I lean forward? In July of 1941, that was when the Nazis broke their treaty with the Soviets and they marched in. Yes, I got it right, July 1941. Um, and that's when the atrocities began almost immediately. And one of the first things that they asked or they demanded that they required was that the, any Jewish man between the ages of 18 and 50 had to come to the police station and register. Now, if we had my PowerPoint and with the map, you would see that my mother's house was right across the river from the center of town where the police station and other administrative buildings were. So it wasn't a big deal to get into town, except that the only person in my mother's family who qualified for this was her twin. Her father was older than 50. The twin boys were younger than 18. But this was the first week of July, and my mother and her twin had turned 18 on July 3rd. So her twin had to go down and register. And uh, he came back from his quarry work. He grabbed something to eat in the house. And he said, this is just a registration. It'll probably take an hour. I'll see you later. And he ran off across the river, across the bridge, in, into the police station to register. And that was the last time they ever saw him. In the police station, what happened was the uh, Gestapo and the SS or whoever was in charge, they had everybody waiting around in various rooms. And after a while, they went around and started asking what people do. And uh, what they ultimately did was they were finding the farmers, the bakers, the butchers, the candlestick makers. Anybody who was a manual laborer was put on one side. The teachers, the doctors, the lawyers, the rabbis, the intelligentsias, my mother said, the educated people were, were put aside. And then around midnight, I think she said it was, all those butchers and bakers and carpenters were told they could go home. The intelligentsia, the doctors and lawyers and students and all the rest, they were taken up to what was called the Fedor Hill. And it's as I told you, the strip of river makes a curve right through the town. And in the middle of that curve, it's like makes a, like a peninsula in the middle of town. And right on the top, there's a, a, it's called the Fedor Hill, in the middle of which is a crumbling two or three hundred year old uh, castle from the kings of Poland and a park with forest all around it. And all those students and doctors and lawyers, etc., were marched into that. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, the entire city, which surrounds this peninsula, could hear the machine guns as 450 Jewish men between the ages of 18 and 50 were shot to death. Their bodies were not found. They were probably thrown in the river because there were never any evidence of where they, that they were buried or that they were somewhere on the, on the Fedor Hill. So they must have been just thrown into the river. This became a weekly event, these actions and raids. The difference between actions and raids, or well, the actions were sweeps through the streets, gathering off up people wherever they could. The raids were they were actually going into people's houses and pulling them out to stand and be counted and shipped away. Um, if people were too weak, too old, too sickly to come out of their house or to get out of the bed, they were shot in bed. Uh, people were often lined up. My uh, mother and her sister and uh, two friends were caught up in one of these sweeps. My mother, her sister, and one of the friends managed to, in the chaos, sweep, uh, get away. And she, they, they fled and got into a building that overlooked the square where the, they saw everybody else was being lined up. The other friend was caught and couldn't get, at, couldn't get away. Her name was Etka Miller, and she was very well known among the students in the group because um, she was just very bright. And she was standing there in the line, and they knew they're going to be shot. They knew they're going to be marched off to, shot, to be shot. 
And so Edgar stepped forward from the line and spoke directly to the commandant who was organizing this. And she told him, the whole city heard this, um, she told him that the Jews have been, uh, people have been trying to uh, kill us over the centuries. You are trying to do that now. And then she said, you will be defeated. And with that, he took out his gun and he shot her in the face. But she knew she was going to be killed. There were several of these roundups. Another time, my mother's twin brothers, the, the identical twins, were caught. And they were brought, and this time they brought them to a jail and the prison in the center of town. And then the Gestapo made it be known that you could ransom your, your loved ones. If you had anything, if you had people that were caught, they were going to allow you to ransom them. So my mother and her family scrounged up her father's, uh, you know those old fashioned watches on a chain that dangle? They got that, they found some of her mother's old, uh, old jewelry, and so with a few pieces like that, uh, that made their way through several layers of people to get to the, to the actual prison. And my mother and her sister, they actually saw the watch being dangled in front of the guard. And um, they, they saw, then they saw, they looked up and they saw the twin boys at the second floor window. And so my, they were yelling at, they saw my mother and her, her sister, Bronya, and they saw her and they were saying, save us, save us. And my mother and her sister waved. And then the crowd that had gathered around all of this commotion saw that these must be two Jewish girls trying to ransom their, their uh, brothers. And so my mother and her sister were beat up. Just for fun, for entertainment. People were laughing. This was entertainment. But they did manage to ransom the boys. They were, it did go through, and they, they did get them home, and they, they hid them in the back room of the house. And whenever the soldiers came around to pick up everybody for their, uh, their troop for the forced labor, they'd ask for the boys. And the, my mother's family would go, well, they, they must have left already. We don't know. They're not here. And they did that for about two weeks, and then finally the, the just stopped asking for them because my mother's family never let those boys out again. Uh, I wanted to tell you just before I go on, if I may, a little bit about the members of her family. Is that okay? My, I spoke already about my mother's older sister. She was an, an extraordinary woman from what I gather. She played the violin, she learned the piano, and when she was getting lessons for the piano, my mother's twin decided he would sit in on it. And without lessons himself, after they would get up and leave, my mother's twin would play what my mother's sister was practicing. Um, he was really good in math. That was a gene that did not get passed down to me. But a lot of, there's a lot of uh, evidence about connections between math and music with people. Anyway, my, so my aunt, my mother's sister, was piano, violin. She belonged to, she also sang. She also belonged to a literary society. This is not a book club where you just read the book and discuss it. This is a society, a literary club where they write poems and the short stories and they discuss that as well as books that they read. Um, she also was an artist. She did a portrait of the president of Poland and she sent it to him, to the president, and actually got a handwritten letter. Anybody remember handwritten letters? a handwritten letter back from the president expressing his appreciation for the portrait that she sent. And she spoke Polish, Yiddish, Hebrew, German, Russian, and taught herself Latin and French. And I grew up hearing languages all my life. My parents both spoke between them five languages. So to me, that was normal, to, but people were multilingual. My mother's brother, the twin brother, he was a very serious student, and he got an A in all his subjects except Polish literature. And he was so determined to get an A in everything that my mother's mother went to see the teacher. How come he didn't get an A in Polish literature? He got an A in everything else. And uh, she said to the teacher, there's no corrections on his tests. There's no comments on his essays, there's no criticism on his homework, how come he doesn't get an A? And the teacher responded without any hesitation and without any embarrassment, no Jew can get an A in Polish literature. Plain as that. Um, 
The younger twins were very identical. I mean, really, the family had trouble telling them apart. And they knew it. And they took advantage of this. So one of the stories my mother told about what they did was they were assigned this great big long poem to memorize. So memorization was frequent at that time in, in schools. And they'd come home and there's like part one and then part two and they're, they're like, you know, the Canterbury Tales, they're tremendous. So Molish memorized part one and Rumik memorized part two. And then when they got to school, they figured whoever gets called on, the other, whoever knows that part. And that's what happened. When the teacher called on Rumek to, to recite part one, Molish stood up because he was the one who had memorized part one, and they, know nobody, they knew nobody could tell the difference. So this was, I wanted to get this in. These were real people to my mother, and I know these stories because she told me these stories about them. These were not just black and white, fuzzy, blurry photographs in some museum. These, are, these people are so real to me because of these stories. So I don't remember where I was in my story already, but oh yeah, they were ransoming the boys. But it just, I really felt it necessary to give you a, a, a little bit of the idea of what these people were. Um, we left off at the ransoming and the various, um, the various, oh, the actions that were going on. Um, the, there was a Judenrat. A Judenrat is the Jewish council and a president was appointed and um, when they had these roundups, the actions and the raids, very often there was a quota, and they had to, the Nazis were looking to gather 350 Jews. And they found, because word would leak out. The Judenrat always had, you know, moles in the government, and they would, word would leak out. There's an action coming tomorrow, or two days, or Wednesday, or whatever. People would hide. So instead of collecting the 300 people, that, or 350 people, whatever their number was, they wouldn't get that many, and they would approach the president of the Judenrat and said, okay, we only found 300, we need 350, you have to go find the other 50. That means that president, the Jewish president of the Jewish council has to go into his community, the ghetto, and pick out 50 people to be sent to death, or to the death camp, the nearest camp was Borky. So what do you do? He looked for the very old, the handicapped, the very sick babies, because these were people that he figured could not make it. They were starving already. And so what he did was try to pick the people that he figured were not going to make it. When they asked him to do it a second time, that they ran short on their quota, he wouldn't do it, so they shot him. The Nazis shot him. So he appointed another president. And when he was asked to do that, they came around to his house and they found he had hanged himself because he wouldn't do it. So these were the things that were going on part of daily life that they saw. Um, at one point, my mother and her sister were out in, their in the fields in, the, in their farm labor, and they were coming back across the field to get back into the city, and three peasant women saw them and stopped them and said, don't go back to the city the blood is running in the streets. Those are my mother's words that the peasant women said, which I find very interesting because while the peasant women didn't take my mother and her sister home or shelter them, the act of telling them, of warning them, was still an act of courage in a way because people could get killed for even helping the Jews. So they warned them and um, there was, they were in the middle of a field, and I have a PowerPoint on this and this. It shows a picture, my mother did a drawing. The field was filled with, you know, when the corn is harvested, when corn, the cobs, so you have those stalks left, they cut them and they make like what looks like teepees. Okay, they look like teepees. So the field was filled with these teepees of corn stalks. So they didn't know where to go and they had to hide, so they went into these corn stalks, teepees and one in each. It was just enough to one person get inside. It's October. October in Ukraine is like February. Well, we're having a nor an abnormal February. It's like in the 20s. It's really cold. Southeastern Poland is very cold. So they were in those, those uh, corn teepees for two days and two nights, and they couldn't take the cold anymore. So on the second night, they ran out in the night 
across the field and made it to the forest. Poland is forested all over. And they made it into the forest, and with their bare hands, once they got inside, they dug themselves a kind of a shallow grave. And the two of them got in there together and pulled over branches and leaves and mud and dirt, whatever they could manage to drag over themselves, which meant they were out of sight, they were out of the wind, and they were out of the cold because they had each other's body heat now to keep them warm. And they stayed there another two days and two nights because when it's a big action, which they got gathered from what the peasant women told them, uh, they, it usually lasted three or four days. And by that time already, the fourth day, they were anxious about what happened to their father and the twin boys. So they decided it must be over. Um, hopefully, they, they were hopeful that it was over by then. And they made it back to the city. When they got there, this has been shown. There are, there are photos and films showing this. The streets were filled with feathers. Now, the feathers was a tactic, this comes from a tactic that the Nazis were teaching all their allies in all the occupied countries. The safest, most secure room in the house, the most private room in the house, the safest room, your bedroom, where there's a bed. And the pillows and the mattresses and the duvets are filled with feathers. What the Nazi tactic was that if they can destroy the, your safest, most secure room, where can you feel safe? You can't feel safe anywhere because your very safest room is destroyed. And so when my mother and her sister arrived in Butchach in the main street, the streets were filled with feathers. The doors were hanging off their hinges, all the windows. This is in the ghetto, of course. The, the windows were all smashed out. And what the feathers covered were all the smashed up furniture, broken pots and pans, dishes and broken glasses, smashed up, everything that they could smash, mirrors, books that were torn apart, everything was scattered. And also underneath the feathers were dead bodies. And the dead bodies were young people because everybody knew this is a raid, this is their meaning to kill us. And so they decided that with their bare hands, they had no weaponry, they were going to at least die fighting. And so they fought these Nazi troops with the, uh, the Ukrainians were the allies of the Nazis. And they had all the guns and weaponry and the dogs and the tanks and all that stuff. And they had nothing, the Jews, but they at least, they died fighting. So my mother and her sister made their way through the streets of the ghetto and they did find alive her father and the twin boys. But they knew now there's no use in trying to hide again in the ghetto because it's clear that the ghetto is being liquidated, that they're, they're getting rid of all the Jews, making it Juden Rhein, Juden free, Jew free. So now they were looking for hiding places all through the city. And wherever they would find a hiding place, and there are stories of all the kinds of hiding places that the Jews were finding, sewers and caves and abandoned buildings, barns, whatever you could think of, any, any shelter. So that's what my mother's family was doing, and it was my mother and her sister who took turns ta going out to find people they could trust who could uh, give them food, give them a crust of bread, a potato, or whatever it was. And it was my mother's sister's turn. Her name was Bronya. It was Bronya's turn, and she was out. It was nighttime, and she started hearing a nighttime action. She heard the tanks, she heard the soldiers. She had to find somewhere to hide immediately. So she found in somebody's backyard, there was an empty tool shed. And she got into that tool shed, and she was stuck there for three days. Three days and three nights. My mother said that when Branya came back to where they were hiding, she was, my mother did this, she was not the same. Today we would probably call it PTSD or something like that. Because what Branya experienced in that 24-hour Roundup up th over three days, 24, 24 or 3 instead of 24-7, was the roundup of over 3,000 Jewish men, women, and children. And as they were being rounded up, they were also being taken back to that Fedor Hill that where my mother's twin had been shot. And over 3,000 Jewish men, women, and children were killed up there. But this time, 
they had thought ahead of time. And we found on the internet a sketch by a survivor of this, um, of this uh, massacre, and he showed where what had happened was before the, the, before the action, the Ukrainians and the Nazis had dug trenches on both sides of the, I wish you could see it, it's like a peninsula, the river curves right around it, so you have the narrowest neck of the peninsula, and right on both sides of that neck, they dug these trenches, and the Jews that were brought up there were made to strip, stand on the edge of the trench, they were shot, they fell right in, right into the trenches in the muddy riverbank. 3,000 Jews. About a week after this, and my mother saw this, um, but about a week after this, the farmers from the surrounding countryside came to the Gestapo headquarters to complain about this particular massacre. Not about the killing of the 3,000 Jews. The problem was that the Stripper River is what they use to irrigate their fields. The blood of 3,000 Jews had leaked through those muddy trenches into the river, and my mother saw this. The river was actually running dark pink. The water was dark pink. And so the farmers objected to having to water their fields. They couldn't water their fields with water that was contaminated by the blood of 3,000 Jews. Could you please not do these murders on the Fedor Hill anymore? And believe it or not, they didn't. After this, they took people, they murdered them in the streets, they murdered them in the fields surrounding the city, they took, or they sent them away to Borky. At this point, I also have uh, a photograph, an actual photograph of the results of one of the actions from Butchach, where the soldiers are standing around over a pile of dead bodies, as if they're showing off their cupcakes at a bake sale. And they're just standing there. They don't mind being photographed. And this is in Butchach. It's not a random picture from somewhere in, the, in Europe. This is from Butchach. Um, the Borky was the other solution and taking and sending them off to the nearest camp. Nobody ever came back from Borky, except once. One time, big surprise. It was men who were, sh this particular shipment was men who had been taken to Borky. That was the nearest camp to Butchach. And they were put in a room where they were held for three days and three nights, no food, no water. And then the guards came in and said, we changed our mind. We're going to send you back to Butchach. Here, here's a pail of water, here's bread, eat, drink, we're sending you back. The men did not believe that they were going to be sent back, but the water is there and the bread is there, so they ate and they drank. Next day, they sure enough were loaded back up onto the, the trucks, and they didn't know where they're being taken. They didn't believe they were taken to being taken to Butchach, but wherever it was, what could they do? But sure enough, there they were, back in the ghetto in Butchach. Nobody could believe it. The crowd, the families were overjoyed. The people who were still in the ghetto couldn't believe that anybody ever got back from Butchach. Hugging, kissing, everybody was just about a few, but after a few days, people started getting sick. Sicker and sicker, because the water that the men had been drinking in that room before they sent them back to Butchach had been contaminated with typhus, deliberately. And that's how the Nazis can say, we didn't kill those people in the ghettos, they died of disease. Yeah, disease that was deliberately spread. Um, let's see. So... This was life for 19, now it's 41, 1941, yeah. And there were just this one after another, and so it became evident to Branya and my mother and her father that it was impossible now to stay, even to find hiding places in the city, because not only was the ghetto being li liquidated, but they were going all through the city to find whoever, whatever Jews they could to liquidate them. So, my mother's family came up with the idea of trying to get back to the farm that um, their father had bought. And I don't remember if I explained about how he had bought the farm. He had bought the farm, this was 1910, and that's when he wanted to get married to my mother's, my, my mother's mother. And he wanted to do something to impress her family. 
and so he wanted to buy a farm. The farm was 10 miles east of Bochach, 168 acres with orchards and grain fields, but Jews were not allowed to own property. Not allowed. He hired a manager, my grandfather. The manager was not Jewish, and when they went to buy the property, they put down the manager's name as the owner, and my grandfather's name as the manager, and that's how he acquired the farm. So, and that's how come his, his, my, mother, my grandmother's family allowed her to marry this very enterprising and ambitious young man. So um, here they were now wanting to flee Butchach altogether, and they said, let's go to the farm. Let's get out of Butchach altogether, but it's 10 miles, which means walking and only at night. How else are they going to get there? Which means a series of places to find hiding places. So this took a long time. And they wound up in various hiding places. Um, the first place I think that I can remember, one of the bigger places, was they got to a farm where they knew the farmer, he knew my, my grandfather, and they asked for shelter. And they thought temporary. And the guy said, you can stay. You can stay in my chicken coop. So he let the, the uh, Bauer family stay in the chicken coop, and they wound up spending the whole winter there uh, from January to March, which was the worst part of the winter. Snow's in Poland. Snow starts falling in November, even late October. Doesn't stop snowing till March. So this way they had the worst of it in the chicken coop. But as the weeks went by, they noticed that uh, the soup was getting waterier, the bread was moldier, the potatoes they were given were smaller and smaller, any beets or root vegetables that they were given were more and more rotten. Everything was increasingly worse. And my mother said that it's clear that the farmer's wife was not happy with them being sheltered there. For one thing, if you got caught sheltering Jews, you could be killed, your entire family could be killed. For another thing, if you knew where Jews were hiding and you reported it, you would get a reward. So my mother's family, the, the reward was a five pound bag of sugar for every Jew you reported, which was like gold. Sugar was impossible to get. So my mother's family figured with all this, the decline in what was being fed to them that either they're getting ready to throw them out or to report them. And they thought it would be better to get out. Besides, it's March now. Better to get out now before they, that anything happened. Uh, my mother always ascribed that the worsening food to the wife. Uh, she was, uh, my mother said she was, um, my mother wouldn't say the word, but she would say she was a bee, meaning she was a son of a bee. Yes. So my mother wouldn't say bitch. So... Um, she said it was uh, entirely, probably her fault. But anyway, they decided they wanted to get to the farm, so let's move on. So one of the next places they found was, I think they found this little, uh, yeah, this field shack. It was a, a shack on the edge of a village. And it's not a, sh a shack in a field, it had, it, but it had all the equipment for working in the field. And by now, it's springtime. All that equipment was out, which meant that nobody would be looking in the shack. So they might as well stay in there. They figured that would be a good place to hide. And it was on the edge of a village, so they would have easy access to get in to see who they could find, who would, they could trust to give them food. Big mistake. What happened was the soldiers would do their drills right there, and they would throw all their equipment against the, the walls, and the kids would come and play soccer, and the ball was constantly banging into the walls. The kids were constantly coming around and jiggling the handle on the door, which was locked from the inside. But they were jiggling the handle. They were banging on the door. It was so much noise. My mother said it was 24-7, just impossible. The tension was unrelenting. And at one point, finally, there was so much banging going on on the door that they thought for sure, for sure that somebody's coming through. Somebody's they're trying to get in, they're gonna crash through the door and get in. So my mother and her family said their final goodbyes to each other. They thought this was it, they were, some, they were gonna be discovered. And they told each other how much they loved each other. And they told each other this was it. This just they were hugging each other. M my mother said her father, not only was he praying, but he said he was, now he was glad that 
Friedel, my, his wife, my mother's mother, had died because this way she didn't see that he was leading his children to the grave instead of to the wedding canopy, to the chuppah. And so he was actually glad that she didn't live to see that. So they were waiting for the end and suddenly the noise just abruptly stopped. It just ended and nobody came crashing through. And my mother said her father suddenly burst out with, who will tell our story? Who will tell what happened to us? Who will tell of our suffering? Who will tell of our despair? And my mother made him a promise right then and there that if she survived, if she lived, she would tell the story. And as it happened, she's the only one who did live. And so she did write that it took a long time, many decades later, um, after she had her family and she had us children and then she got rid of us as we grew up and she had the time. And my father, he had found a cousin and she had written her book. Her book is being used by the California state government in the, state, in the school curriculum. And so that cousin of my father's persuaded my mother, sit down and write your story, which I'm telling you. And so my mother did and she wrote it out longhand on yellow legal pads, which nobody I talk to under the age of 15 understands what that is. And uh, then I, she gave it to me, and I typed it up on an electric typewriter. <laughs> and then I gave that, and she, my sister put it on, at the time, this was like the late 90s, uh, it was, she put it on a floppy disk. But my mother didn't go with that disk business, and the, my mother took the typescript, copied it, wrapped it up in brown paper like you used to get from the supermarket and went to the library and looked up all the names and addresses of publishers and she sent them out in those brown paper packages and Fordham University accepted it. And so in the year 2000, my mother's book, Our Tomorrows Never Came, was published by Fordham University Press. We are in our fifth edition now. But that was the promise that my mother had made to my father, that if she lived, she would tell the story. And it, Sorry? To your grandfather. To my grandfather. To, to her father, yes. To, she told her grandfather. When he said, who will tell of our despair and all that, and she said, she'll do it. So um, anyway, they got out of that field check, which was horrendous to stay in, and they kept moving. And now they came to the village like a small village that was right next to their farm property. But before they went, that's 168 acres that they didn't, you know, they'd have to cross. So they were looking around in the village and they found in the middle of the village a house that was empty, a small bungalow. All right, instead of trekking across all those acres to find the house, they can stay here. Nobody was there. This is a village that knows them. They know the people. They know who they can trust. Hey, why not stay there? And that's what they did. They moved into this little bungalow, and they thought things were going well. They went there. They were there for most of the summer. Towards the end of the summer, the owner comes back. Turned out he was a manager of a farm in the next county. He had a bungalow there, and now he was coming back to check on his bungalow in the in the city in the village because this is where he would spend the winter, and he was coming back to make sure it was in good shape. Well, he, walk, he opened the door and he sees the Bowers all hiding in there and without any hesitation, he just started screaming at them, get out, get out now, no negotiation, get out right now. And the Bowers were actually, that's okay because they're thinking he could have run to the police station and reported them. He could have done any number of things. Instead, he's just telling them to get out. Okay, so they left. But where could they go? They're surrounded by fields. So... For the remainder of the summer, they were hiding in the grain fields, just in the open air. Um, my mother said rainy days were best because when the rainy rains came, even the dogs didn't come out. Otherwise, they were constantly on the move. You couldn't stay in one place because the farm dogs were running all over the place. The farmers were now beginning the harvest, so there was less and less field in which they could hide. And so as they are moving around and going from field to field, they were making their way towards their house, the house that they had lived in when they had the house in the city and the house on the farm. And when they get there, 
They approached it slowly, carefully, and they look in. The house, the main house on their farm was still standing because the Russians had used it as a school. Uh, all the other outbuildings, barns, everything was, had been taken down, burned down, destroyed. But the house was standing, and they look in, and there's an old woman in there. My mother said she was, they knew her. She was like flighty. My mother would do it like this. She was a flighty woman. Anyway, she was an old woman. She saw them. She knew them. They knew her. The woman said, of course you could stay here. It's your house. But she warned them that the villagers bring her supplies every week. And so they should stay in the back rooms, and she would stay in the front room so that when the villagers came, that my mother's family would be out of sight. And this worked. This went on for weeks and weeks. It was fine as the, as the fall went into winter. And then one time, the villagers came, and they were spending a lo much longer time there in the house than they usually did. And the old woman, she's looking at the time, and she's thinking, oh, I usually bring, she's thinking to herself, because my, my mother saw what she did, this is when it's supper time already. So there was a big pot of potato soup on the stove, and the old lady goes over, ladles out potato soup into a serving bowl, and walks down the hall with the serving bowl, flings open the door where my mother is hiding with her family. The villagers can see my mother and her family. They can see the villagers. Big mistake because everybody knows what's what. Everybody knows these are Jews that are hiding. Everybody in my mother's family know these are villagers, a whole bunch of them. Somebody's going to blab. What can they do? What can they do? The only thing was get out of the house fast, back into the fields. But we're now in fall. It's nothing left there basically on the field to hide in. They spent two days in the, in the field, whatever they could find, a tree, a stump, a bush, whatever, to hide in but they didn't see anybody coming back to the house. So maybe after all, no villagers actually did blab. Um, they, looks like it was okay. When they, so they decided to go back to the house, nobody showed up, and the, the old woman is gone. The reason that the villagers had stayed longer was they were preparing to take her with them back to the village so that they wouldn't have to schlep out there to the to farm all the time. So now my, my mother's family had the house to themselves, all to themselves. They thought it was great. Everybody knew the war is winding down. We're getting close to the end. It's going to be over. It's going to be over. They can make it now through, uh, through the war, and they'll stay in their house. In fact, a few days later, the airplanes came, one of those runs of airplanes came overhead, and the twins ran outside looking at the airplanes, all excited. It's the Americans! It's the Americans! The war will be over tomorrow! Tomorrow will be finished! Tomorrow will be free! And they were so excited, they wanted to, the things they were making plans. Tomorrow we'll go to school. Imagine, teenage boys, they wanted to go back to school. Tomorrow we'll find our friends. Tomorrow we'll find our books. Tomorrow... And then one of the twins said, no, wait, and imagine this, think about this. We're talking about 16, 17-year-old boys, must be, and they were all excited, and, and he says, wait, what I really want tomorrow when the war is over is a whole loaf of bread just for myself. These are teenage boys who were eating a potato that had to be split five ways. Whenever they, whatever they got, a bowl of soup, everybody ate from the same. And so his big thing was he would get a whole, to eat a whole loaf of bread just by himself. That's why my mother's called the book Our Tomorrows Never Came. Because on March 8th, it was the Jewish holiday of Purim. They knew the holidays, even in the camps, they knew when the holidays were. And another, they knew one thing because it was Purim, because Purim is always on a full moon in the spring, in the early spring, and it was a full moon. The snow was three feet deep on all the fields, so my mother said it was like daylight outside with the full moon shining on all these acres of unbroken snow. And everything was perfectly quiet. It was nighttime. And then they heard the owls start to screech. And then they heard the Crows start to caw, caw, make that noise. Animals, when they're disturbed, they start making noise. The next thing they heard were the dogs. And the dogs were barking, and they were followed shortly thereafter by the soldiers who were screaming and shouting. And this time, they did come bursting through the door. 
and they crashed in through the door. My mother's family ran to the back of the room, the back of the house, the back rooms of the house, and her sister and her father started screaming, jump out the window, jump, run, run away, jump out the window. So first the twins jumped out. They were the first to jump out the window. Don't forget the snow is two to three feet deep, and they're trying to run to try to make it. There's a forest on the edge of the fields. So they were running. They started to run. And my mother, the soldiers are shouting. They're running around the outside of the house. My mother, sister, and father is screaming, jump out the window, Tonya, jump, jump out the window, run away. So my mother was the next one to jump out the window. She got about 10 yards away and whack. She was hit on the head because the soldiers had come around the back. And she was hit on the head with the butt of a rifle from one of the soldiers. She fell unconscious into the snow. She does not know if she was unconscious for five seconds or five minutes. But when she opened her eyes, there were shiny black boots standing over her, and the, pink, the snow around her head was pink. She closed her eyes, she didn't move, she didn't breathe. The shiny black boots moved away, figuring why waste a bullet on what is apparently a dead body. He hadn't seen her open her eyes. And he ran off to join the other soldiers chasing the boys to catch them. They did. They caught the boys. They brought them back to the front field of the house. Then the soldiers came into the house, took out my mother's sister and her father, marched them out to the front field to join the twins. And there, where my mother could see and hear, she watched her entire family being shot to death. And then the dog stopped barking and the soldiers moved off. My mother tried to crawl, tried to lift herself up out of the snow. She said, I, who will take me in now? Who will help me? Who will come for me now? With, she, she didn't even know what to do. And as she's trying to crawl, she sees that way across the field, there's three figures coming back. They saw me moving, they saw me moving, they're coming back to kill me. They're coming back, they saw that I moved. So she curled herself up back into the snow, and she started saying every prayer that she knew, and she waited. She listened for death to come crunching towards her on the snow. When those three figures got close enough, she heard them speaking, and their voices were not hostile. And they weren't speaking Russian. They weren't speaking German or Ukrainian. They were speaking Polish. These were three Polish boys from that Polish village where they had sheltered once, who had heard, the commo who had heard all the shooting and the shouting. And they thought that their Polish village was under attack. The Poles and the Ukrainians had been enemies for centuries. And the Ukrainians, which had, who had allied themselves with the Nazis, were taking advantage of the war not only to kill Jews, but to kill their centuries-old enemies, the Poles. So these kids the, came from that village where they thought they were under attack. And when nothing happened, they came out to see what all the commotion was about. And they saw my mother. They did see her move, and they recognized her. They knew who she was. So they picked her up out of the snow, and they took her back to their, to their village, and when they got to one of the houses of one of the three boys, they stuffed her under a pile of straw next to the chimney, and they kept her there for two weeks. Because for two weeks, every day, the Ukrainian thugs who had murdered her family were looking for the dead body. They saw the footsteps in the snow. They knew that the body must have been moved to the village or a live person because nothing was dragged. They saw the footsteps. So for two weeks they kept coming around looking for the dead body that wasn't dead. And then it stopped because the Russians arrived. And now the Russians, who were no longer allies with the, with the Nazis after the Nazis broke the treaty in, in 1941, they liberated the area. The whole area was now liberated. Two weeks too late. After another couple of weeks, my mother recovered a little, and she and the Polish boy in whose house she was being sheltered, they took a shovel, 
and I went out into the field to find the bodies of the Bauer family. And he found them. The boy dug a, dug a big grave, one big grave for the whole family. My mother helped him place the bodies in the grave, but she, stood, she said she couldn't even cry. She stood like a stone. She was angry at God. She just stood there. The boy took a shovel, and he was going to put the dirt, and he stopped. He said, we can't just throw dirt on them like they're animals. We have to do something. 95% of the Polish population is Catholic. This boy was a Catholic. And so he said something that my mother remembered to the end of her life, really and literally to the end of her life, no exaggeration. He said, every human being deserves a decent burial. And thereupon, a Polish Catholic boy said a Polish Catholic prayer for Jews who were murdered for being Jews. And my mother was grateful for his consideration and his thoughtfulness. But she had no further reason now to stay in the farmhouse, the house of death. She decided she would go back to the house in Puchac, to the house in town. It was liberated. It was her house. She might as well go back there. When she got back to Puchac, it took her quite a while because she had to go find, a find people who would take her on a wagon, walking, whatever she, whichever way she could get there. Don't forget, they're 10 miles away. So she got back to the house. The houses of the Jews were being completely robbed. Everybody knew the Jews are not coming back, and everybody was stealing whatever they could steal from the houses of the Jews. My mother even saw at one point somebody walking out of her house with the rug from her living room rolled over his shoulders. That, this was a little later, but she saw that. Anyway. She gets back to her house. Most of it is emptied out, but it's still livable. It's her house. Where else will she go? She didn't know what to do with herself. But every room she went into, this was the room where her father did his paperwork. That was the room where she did homework with Monio, her twin. That was the room where the kids, the twins, used to play games on the carpet that was later stolen. That was the kitchen where her mother and her sister used to cook up all these recipes. It was torture, the memories. It was like being haunted. She couldn't stand it. She couldn't stay down in those rooms. And she didn't know what to do at that point and then thought of the attic. The attic was full of all the stuff that they stored, but they never lived up there. So she went up into the attic. And of course, most of it was emptied out. It was completely emptied out, in fact. There was nothing there. But as she's looking around, I have a prop here. Can I take a prop out? As she's looking around, this is the front of the house. There's a little front entry that projects out from the main part of the house. So you have a little bit like a, a just a front entryway, okay? Now she's up in the attic and she's looking at that front entryway part that sticks away from the main body of the attic. Now I'm gonna turn it around. This is the inside and she notices there's a plank loose in the wall. So while my mother and her family were hiding in chicken coops and abandoned tool sheds, somebody had gotten into their house and had built a false wall with a hiding place just big enough for one person to sit in a fetal position inside. There was a little hole in the roof so that you can look out into the street, and this was it. She doesn't know and never found out who had made that hiding place and whatever happened to that person, but she figured this is where she could stay. There'll be nobody, no, no haunting, no phantoms, no ghosts to, to torture her. So she crawled in there, had to sit all curled up like this, and um, she figured this is, this will be okay, except that for the first few nights, she said she had the most horrendous nightmares. She thought she was screaming, but apparently she must have been screaming in her head because if they would have heard her, 
people would have maybe come. But anyway, she kept seeing the death scene, the shooting, just like a video loop. In fact, that's what I told her. What she described to me, I said, Ma, that's a video loop. <laughs> and she just kept seeing the whole murder scene over and over again. She said that went on for about a week. Anyway, um, at least she was, you know, she'd go downstairs during the day, but whenever she came up here, the nightmares would start again. Eventually, um, you know, she's, uh, things are like what to do with yourself, but the war is not over. I mean, they're liberated, but the war is still, they're still fighting. And she would find this something to eat here and something to eat there and okay, whatever. But every time she found something to eat, she brought it up to this little hiding place so she'd have something overnight. And that way, she, in the morning, she would have breakfast ready. So she, and she just didn't want to be out. You never knew what was going to happen. Good thing. Because she went to sleep one night. She had four slices of bread that night that she had brought upstairs with her. And when she woke up the next morning, it wasn't the Russians that she saw in the street. The Nazis were back. And which house did they pick as their headquarters? And they invaded and took over her entire house. It's only one floor. And she's up here behind that plank in the attic. She has four slices of bread with her. She figured the war is almost over. Everybody knows that by now. It's only a skirmish. How long can it last? Won't be much. She wasn't worried. But just to be on the safe side, she ate only one piece of bread. Out of the four slices she had with her, she ate only the one piece of bread. Just, we'll, no, you know, we'll be safe. Now, the soldiers were going out to do the fighting still, but they left a guard. He was downstairs, she could hear him coughing, he was probably sick, and that's why they chose him to be the guy who gets to stay home and be the guard. The problem wasn't this guy so much, this guard so much, as the fact that people were streaming through the Jews' houses looking for things to rob. They were coming in and out, people, civilians, off-duty soldiers, policemen, anybody was looking for what they could get. These were the dangerous people, because if they saw a Jew, what's one more dead Jew? Nobody would care. They would have killed her. So she'll wait it out. It can't be long. It's almost over. But as the days progressed, she realized maybe she ought to be more conservative. So she started breaking the bread into smaller and smaller pieces. And by the end of the week, you know when you finish your chocolate chip cookie and you do this, you get the last sprinkles and every last calorie. She was down to those little crumlets of bread. That's all she had left. That was they're still there. They're still fighting, and they're still staying down there, and they're still coming through the house. She waited another week. She waited a third week. At the end of the fourth week, she was very hungry. Hunger is a terrible thing. Thirst is a thousand times worse. She'd had no water for a month. Her head was exploding. Her eyes were like pincushions with needles in them. Her tongue was swollen, but the tissues in her throat were so dry that when she tried to swallow, they would tear and she could taste the blood. She knew she is dying of thirst. She is dying of thirst. She had a choice. She could stay safe in her hiding place. Nobody knew she's there, and she was certain to die of thirst. Or she could risk going down and trying to find at least water. There's really no choice. There's really no choice. She had to take the risk. She looked out of that hole in the roof to make sure nobody had come in, nobody had, was going out. There was no action going either way. So the only thing she had to contend with was the soldier on guard and decided now's the time. And she went downstairs and she made her way through the back rooms. It's her house, she knows the layout, through the back rooms and the outer passages and she made it all the way to the kitchen 
He didn't hear her, he didn't see her, that soldier, and she found what she called a beautiful pail of water. She actually, she, did, she would always do it like this, a beautiful pail of water. And she said she then drank half of it with one gulp. Which I need now too. And then she got greedy. She wanted that pail of water with her in the attic. At least she'd have water, if not food. She dragged that pail back upstairs with her. All this, nobody came in there. She was really like, nobody came around. The soldier didn't hear her. Or if he did, he probably thought it was people streaming through the house looking for stuff to rob. So he didn't even go. And she got the pail all the way up to the attic. And when she brings it to the plank, to, to the opening, it wouldn't fit through the opening. The pail was wider than the opening. Now imagine my mother, a whole human being, fit through that opening, the pail didn't. She must have looked like those concentration camp survivors that they weigh like 65 pounds because what had my mother eaten? Nothing for a month, but nothing really for two and a half years. She was sharing a potato with five people. What can she do? There's nothing up there, the attic is bare. And she looks around, and then she found in the corner, one of the corners of the attic, she found what she said were 100-year-old bottles. They were full of dirt and dust and spider webs and dead bugs. And honest to God, my mother said about that, about the dead bugs, they would be protein. <laughs> And there are stories of people who were, ate, were eating, I mean, I know personally one of the concentration camp, death camp survivors who said they used to eat the lice off of each other's bodies because that would be protein. I'm not making that up. You can't make that up. So my mother took the bottles and poured the water from the pail into the three bottles or four bottles, whatever she had, and then she kicked the bucket all the way in the shadowiest corner she could find and then took the bottles with her back into the, into the hiding place and she was closing the plank. She was, there was a latch on the inside of this plank and she was closing this back up when boom, 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 she hears the soldiers are back and they come running into the house, all over the house, and they come running up the stairs. They always came up. They came up to look around. What's here now? Nothing changed. Nothing was different. My mother said she's looking through the planks. She stopped breathing. She just terrified, didn't make a motion, didn't make a sound. She could see the eyes. One of the soldiers came around, and she could see his eyes. He was that close, but he didn't see her. He didn't hear her. They didn't see anything to steal, and they went back down. If they had seen that wet pail, with the wet spot on the floor where she spilled water, pouring it into the bottles. What's a wet pail doing there? They would have known. They would have known somebody's up here because they knew the Jews found hiding places wherever they could. They would have tapped on all the walls till they found an empty sound. But they didn't see it. But then, after that success, my mother decided she could try again. And so, some days later, she decided to go down to try to find food. This time she found lima beans. She said they were so hard, it was like trying to chew pebbles. <sighs> no good. So she had to try again. And this time, the next time that she went down, not every day, but the next time she went, because she still had the water, the next time she went down, she found, she said, a small bag of moldy grain, oats. So she took it. Best decision, she said, she made because she took that little bag of oats that occupied her the rest of the day. She scraped each individual grain free of the mold. She just kept scraping with her nails, scraping the mold off of each grain. When she finished, she said, I had a little pile like this, and I had my water. I had a picnic. And she spent the second month, and the third month, and the fourth month that way. And on July 22, 1944, she looked out that little hole in the roof and she saw the Russians were back. They liberated the area again. She wasn't quick to run down because we had fooled, got fooled by this before. So she waited. And this time though, she saw her schoolmate Matilda and Junik and Regina. And one after another, she started seeing these people come out of hiding, and so she figured, no, now it's safe, now it's real. 
1939, the Jewish population of Bochach was 13,000. In 1944, there were 50 people left. And that includes people who had fled across the border into Russia thinking they could escape from the Holocaust. And they, some of them survived, some of them didn't, but altogether, there were 50 people left. Those 50 people, they got together, there's a photo in the book and in the PowerPoint, shows the 50 people gathered together around a granite monument that they had carved in memory of those who had been killed in uh, Bochach. And the Russians then, when the war was over, now it's over for them, and they said, uh, you can stay. You, this was, oh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead a year, because 1944 was when they were liberated, but this is now a year later, this monument. In the, in the intervening year, my mother had gotten together with three other uh, young women who had also lost their entire families. In total, by the way, my mother lost over 60 members of her extended family after the war, a few years after the war, 1952. My mother found one cousin, one cousin who had survived. She had been a servant on a rural farm that was so far isolated that nobody ever found her. So um, that was the one cousin she found. And the only other relatives were the, the uncle who went to Palestine after Kristallnacht. And anyway, um, so they, she got together with these three other young women. And uh, they got together in a house and they earned a living as seamstresses to make some monies while they were waiting out the end of the war. Because that was, they were liberated in 44. The war ended in May of 45. And... Um, that's when they got together all these 50 people that had survived and made that monument. And the Russians then announced that the Jews were welcome to stay in Russia if they wanted. But if you stayed, it's forever. If they were closing the border. If you want to leave, leave now. So everybody, all 50 people, decided to pack up and leave which meant using bed sheets to make knapsacks and putting together suitcases out of like cardboard tied together with string. And um, that's what my mother had. She had two suitcases tied together with string or rope. And they went to the train stations. There were no scheduled trains. You would wait and wait until whatever train came took you to wherever it was going, but away from here. And while she was waiting at the train station, one of the suitcases started to fall apart she was working on it, trying to tie it together again. And while she was doing that, this guy down on the, on the other end of the platform, he saw that she was working with her suitcase. So he came over to help her tie the suitcase together. And a few years later, I was born. Anyway, uh, that was my father who was on his way to his hometown, Lvov, but he never went because he met my mother and he was happy with that. He had walked across from Siberia. It had taken him a year. When, when the Russians liberated that slave labor camp that he had spent two and a half years in, um, they just said, goodbye, good luck. The prisoners had been shipped to the camp by train, but now they were told, goodbye, good luck, make your own way back. So he had to work and walk his way back. It took him a year to, to get back to Poland. He was um, with some friends. They had walked together at, um, in, into Poland. Then he made it in, and they decided all together, my mother and a bunch of people, that they were going to head for America. My mother remembered that her mother's sister, my mother's aunt, had gone to America in 1933. So let's go to America. So they made their way across Romania and Austria and Czechoslovakia and whatever, Germany. They finally wound up in a displaced persons camp in Stuttgart in Germany, where it took them a year to get the papers that they needed. They had a civil wedding because if you weren't married, you weren't guaranteed that you were on the same, would be on the same boat together. 
My father was an excellent chess player, so among the things they were doing in the DP camp was my father would find chess games going on, and he would play chess. And one time there was a game that he saw going on, and the guy, one guy was losing, losing badly. And this was a game for a prize. There was a prize at the end of the game. So my father sees the guy is losing. He said, you want me to win that game? I'll win that game. But I get the prize if I win it. The guy said, you can't win that prize. I can't win that game. It's horrible. Look what I did. I made a mess out of it. I'll win the game. Let me take over. So my father took over. By the way, my father taught me chess when I grew up. But my father took over the game. Yes, he did win. The prize was a diamond ring, and that's how my mother got engaged. <laughs> so that was in the DP camp, and they got, they, they got on the boat together, um, and they made it to America in January 27th, I think it was, 1947. If you Google it, it was the third worst snowstorm in New York City history until that time. And um, then they had the religious wedding. Uh, once they, were st they found my mother's aunt and they were staying there. I once asked my mother that Auntie Pauline only had one extra room. Where'd you stay in that month between January and February when you had your real wedding? <laughs> Didn't answer. Anyway, um, they got married. Uh, my father uh, eventually started a business. He made the, uh, you know when you go into a pizzeria or a Chinese restaurant, the kitchens for those places? He was a stainless steel worker. He, anytime you go into any one of these restaurants and you see those stainless steel equipment, that's what he made. We ate well. Every time a restaurant opened, we went, we were invited for the opening night. So we ate really well. Um, for those days. Anyway, um, that's what he, that was, he started that business. He promised my mother that, and right away at the beginning, at the wedding, he said in five years we would have a business and a car. And he did. He had a business, and we had a green Dodge. I remember the car. It was a green Dodge. And um, so there they were in America, in the Bronx, across the street from the Bronx County Courthouse on the Grand Concourse. And um, then uh, when I was nine and a half years old, we moved out to Little Neck in Queens, 300 yards from the Nassau County border. And I thought everybody on the block spoke funny because they all spoke Long Island. And where I had grown up, that building was all full of survivors. It was all Jews from Europe. And I heard all different languages with all different accents. And so th that was normal to me. Hearing Long Island was unusual. Um, as I, I don't remember if I, I pointed out, but my father had been in the slave labor camp. Before this being shipped to the slave labor camp, he had been in hiding, got caught, escaped, got caught, escaped. This happened several times. And each time he got out, he was out for a while. He was doing all kinds of things. He even stole a Nazi uniform and paraded around in that for a while, figuring that he wouldn't get caught wearing a Nazi uniform because he spoke German, so he was able to, he figured he'd be able to fool them. But he kept getting caught, which doesn't say too well for his hiding skills, but anyway, he did. And then finally, one time, he was um, caught and they brought him to the Gestapo headquarters and they left him with one guard on the ground floor, and it was nighttime. Uh, my father was a compact man and built like a bull. And I had seen him knock a nail in with his bare hand. He was a very, very strong man. So they left him alone with the guard. That was stupid because my father promptly knocked the guard out, jumped out the window. They were on the first floor and ran for his life. Uh, he was running... These are only, we know only a very few stories that we know um, that he told my mother. He never told me directly. Um, and he was running towards the Russian border. He was figuring on getting away by running to the Russian border. We were really close to the Russian border. And he had to cross a river. There was a bridge. It was nighttime. He starts running across the bridge. There was nobody on it. He couldn't see anything. And then coming from the, as he's halfway across, or almost halfway across, he sees that there are guards coming from the other side, one guard. And the other guard is coming across, and they knew there's nothing. He's, there's no way of avoiding him. He's now on the bridge. He's been seen. 
And when he came up to the guard, the guard's going to ask him for his ID. He has none. He's been on the run. And so he knocked the guard out. And then he doesn't know if that guard was alive or dead, but he threw him off the bridge because there was no choice. There was no choice. And he just kept running off into the night. And he ran towards the Russian border. And then where he came into a Russian camp, they arrested him because what he didn't know was that nearby there had been a, a Nazi encampment. And they thought that he was a spy for the Nazi. And he did a lot of fast talking because they said, for Nazi spies, we execute you on the spot. Um, he did a lot of fast talking, and then there was finally no other way. He figured out that the only way to prove that he wasn't a Nazi was to expose the one part of him that would prove that he was a Jew. And then they said, okay, but you were doing the wrong thing at the wrong place, and that's how he wound up in the slave labor camp. And so they shipped him there, and that's how he spent the rest of the war, two and a half years in the slave labor camp. And then the rest of it I told backwards. He came back to Poland, and that's my story. We're just gonna like, okay, so now we're just gonna talk about how your life was growing up. So you said that you heard like different languages and stuff like that. Like, were there anything different when it came to like eating or something like different? Because you spoke about the fact that your father didn't eat leftovers and your mother. Yeah, he also, he wouldn't wear, he wouldn't wear anything striped. He would not wear any striped shirts. If you bought him a birthday present, it had to be solid or flowers or plaid or something. Um, I grew up thinking it's normal that everybody had all these things because the whole building, I mean, till I, I said we, we moved when I was home, well, nine and a half, basically, and everybody there was either a survivor or had been a child or, and would, had come over, but they all, all spoke foreign languages. I grew up thinking that's normal. And um, they sent me to, uh, they first, the first year at kindergarten, I think I was in public school, but after that they sent me to a yeshiva. How my parents, new immigrants, found the money to, ship, to pay for a yeshiva for me, and then for my brother as well, he, he was born two, two and a half years later. Um, when I got on the bus to go to school, my brother used to cry and bang on the school bus doors. He wanted to go with me. <laughs> so... Uh, but that was um, what I thought was normal. So I, I didn't feel different because, and especially in the yeshiva, it was full of children of survivors. So I didn't feel any, or even realize it. Airmail letters would come from Poland. They found, my father found his two oldest brothers. He had four brothers and a sister. He found the two oldest brothers. So uh, he got one out the second oldest brother, and he came to live with us in the Bronx. The eldest brother, he didn't find him until another year later or so. Uh, this was already in the early 50s, and I, there was a quota in, at that time uh, for getting refugees in, and my uncle's number was too high, and he couldn't get him in. So eventually what my uncle did was he moved to Israel, and by that, by the time his number came up that he could come to America, he'd married, had three children, and he had a business. So he wasn't going to come over. So we got aerograms. I don't know if you know what an aerogram is. Okay, it's this blue, like, onion skin paper. It's very light. Okay, it's like a sheet of paper that you can see through, but it's very light. You wrote on the on one side, and then you had you folded it up in this lines where you folded it up in three places, and the stamp was on the outside. It was pre-printed, so all you had to do was lick it together, and then you had your. That's how you mailed it. You didn't have to stick a stamp on it. You just wrote the address on the outside. So we used to get aerograms. Occasionally, we would get letters, which I loved because then I had the stamps. That started my stamp collection. So then my uncle moved to Israel, so we got stamps from Israel. But that's we didn't see him until 1970. The whole family went to Israel, and my father and his brother had a reunion there, um, which was very interesting because by that time, my father's Yiddish was full of English, and my uncle's Yiddish was full of Hebrew. And talking to each other, they had quite a, an interesting uh, situation there. My father would ask, for instance, "Vifelazaiga is the dinner," which means, "At what time is dinner?" But dinner in Hebrew is thunder. So essentially, my father was asking my uncle, "What time is thunder?" 
As that's what my uncle would understand because he heard dinner dinners. So it was a they you know was an interesting reunion. Anyway, um, yeah. So we moved out to Long Island and Little Neck. I was we were they were all Jews on at that time. Everybody was there was a very Jewish neighborhood, um, but everybody was American born, and all the all the parents were American born and the children were American born. No, it wasn't all Jews. Our next door neighbors weren't Jews actually, but anyway, they were all American born. Um, being a child of a survivor of two survivors. It didn't really sink in until much later. First of all, I didn't know my father's story. They didn't, he didn't talk. My mother didn't really say anything until about, I remember, when I was 12. And that's when I said, how come I don't have, because everybody's going Thanksgiving and all these holidays. How come we don't have grandparents? So my mother's answer was that, she didn't tell the story. She didn't tell all of this. She just said that they were killed. They died. No, they died. Then it came out next time. Well, it was the war, and they got killed. That's all. She didn't make a big story like this, so this. <clears throat> and I remember this because I remember being 12, and I remember I, it was winter time. It must have been for Thanksgiving. And I remember opening the window in my bedroom. It was freezing cold. I remember the air being freezing cold. And it was nighttime, and I remember screaming, screaming to the stars, to the nighttime, that she's wrong. She made a mistake. They're probably, they got lost. We'll have to go find them. That's how come I remember that that's when I learned that they were, that they were killed. I remember definitely, she's so wrong. She's mistaken. She just got lost. They got lost. We'll go back. We'll go to Poland. We'll find them. We'll find her family. And then after that, it came out in little bits and pieces. I mean, all of this mostly came out about 25 years ago, really. Not, not, my, you know, not while I was even a teenager, not while I was in college. It, I didn't feel, you know, anything. All my friends were, nobody had Holocaust survivor parents. So I didn't talk about it because I didn't register it. And, um, when she started working on this, and then it really began to sink in. And that's when I became aware, and it's consumed my life now. It's absolutely consumed my life. Um, from January to June last year, I did 63 presentations like this. And then there was a hiatus during the summer, and then it resumed again in the fall. Um, I did six of these last week, and I have seven this week. You are the second today. Uh, your professor there said that I'm doing more time doing this than I did when I was teaching. <laughs> uh, so I think we have everything. Is there anything that you would want to include to you know, the younger generations or anyone that is watching this because it will be students? I would like to include what my mother wants to in, includes on her video in that people, the Holocaust started with words, with hate and with words, with bullying. Telling the Jew to get off the sidewalk and stand in the street is bullying, and it's the beginning. And how these two people, both survivors of the worst hatred ever perpetrated against the Jewish people, raised three children not to hate. I don't understand how they did it. I don't, they had every right to come out bitter, vindictive. No. They, they don't see that what they taught me is that it's what's in, it, don't judge a book by its cover, right? You read the book, that's what's inside. And the way I was putting it is that it, Whatever you put a pin in anybody, there's still the blood comes out red. And that's what matters, what's inside. I don't care what package you're in, except if you're thin and I'm fat. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's their message, that the Holocaust started with bullying and with words, and they, she just doesn't want, she wanted the stories to be told so people remember, and that if you remember, history, then maybe you won't repeat it. 
except she knows. She would say, a lot of the Holocaust survivors would end their speech with never again, you hope it never happens again. My mother ended hers with saying, no, it has happened again. She's sorry, she knows it's happened again, but you still have to keep trying. And one more thing, if I may. Um, before the war in Europe, Jews did not parade around that they were Jews, unless, you know, you didn't go celebrate Hanukkah in public, you didn't celebrate Passover in public. My mother told great stories about what, you know, celebrating Passover was like. They went to the farm, they did it, they did the celebration, but you didn't do that. And at Christmas and Easter, Jews wouldn't go out on the street in the cities of Poland before, because you could get beaten up or killed just for being out on, you know, the Jews killed Christ thing. So at Christmas and Easter, Jews stayed home, you locked your doors, you closed the shutters, and you stayed out of the way. Fast forward to a few decades and another continent, and there's my mother and me, and she sees Mayor Koch, a Jewish mayor, and he's a Jewish mayor in the biggest city in the country, and he's on a gigantic a uh, cherry picker with a rabbi, and they're lighting a humongous Hanukkah menorah in public, in Central Park, with Hanukkah music playing in the background, all of it televised live. My mother was, she would end her talks with that story, and God bless America. That's how she would end. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much. I Anybody have any other questions? Uh, Even I, off the record? <laughs> I brought an extra copy of the book if anybody wants it. <laughs>